go all the way back to the beginning of Romeo and Juliet. A lot of students have contacted me because they're trying to bump up their grades from third quarter. And so since we spent the entire third quarter doing Romeo and Juliet, going back and rehashing those subjects in those classes where some people lost some points is probably the best way to do it. So I'm going to be putting out this Act 1 video this week. I will try to get out Act 2 next week. Well, I'll definitely get it out by next week. I'll try to get it out by the end of this week. But slow internet connection continues to hamstring me. And for that, I apologize. But we can't complain too much as we continue to telecommute our way to education. So here's the video that you want to look to if you want to make up your Romeo and Juliet first quiz, if you're trying to bump up some daily grades, or if you're just bored and daytime television isn't doing it for you anymore and you've already finished Netflix, here is Mr. Ganley's version of Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 1. Okay, so Romeo and Juliet begins with a prologue wherein the chorus steps on stage and they help uh, the audience build a mental model for everything that's going to happen in the play. Shakespeare is okay with giving us spoilers for his works. He knows he's about to put on a play that's over two hours long during the day when the weather permits. So it's entirely possible that, especially among the groundlings, the people who had to stand up for the entire play, your attention might drift. So actually, he, he makes sure he builds in a great deal of repetition of themes and ideas to make sure that even if you're only halfway paying attention, you still come away with a complete understanding of everything he was trying to communicate. So once again, as we read this, you'll hear the iambic pentameter, the rhythm of unstressed and then stressed syllables with five stressed syllables per line. Um, if you want me to break that down in more detail, I can go back to the introducing Shakespeare unit that we did before this. Uh, I'll maybe string that out after we get Act 1 and Act 2 out there on YouTube. But anyway, so here's the chorus telling us what we need to know in terms of background information and spoilers to make sense of what even in Shakespeare's time was probably a difficult play. But we can do it. So, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. So those first four lines are what's called a quatrain, quatrain, four, quattro. You've got that unit. And, and Shakespeare in his sonnets, in his sonnets, in his sonnets, wrote through three quatrains and a couplet. So there's going to be three groups of four and then a group of two at the very end, which will rhyme. Now, the other thing that he's doing with this prologue, apart from satisfying, you know, poetic needs of a sonnet, what he's also doing is he is giving us the necessary exposition that we need for the play. Now, he's, he's telling us what is the setting in fair Verona. So this is set in ancient Verona, Italy. This is not in England. Right? Cool. We now know that this is a setting in a far off place that gives us a little bit more room to play with our imaginations and the limits of reality because you have to suspend your disbelief in order to get into any play these are actors on stage the events of this play take place in seven freaking days and that's pretty absurd given the amount of action that takes place to these characters but if we suspend that disbelief we'll still be able to understand and enjoy what's going on before us so we've got the setting, we've got the conflict, two households, ancient grudge breaks to new mutiny. So we've got these two households that are alike in dignity, they're equal in stature, but they're fighting over an ancient fight, probably something so old that people don't even remember, all right? And it's bloody, all right? And there's a, there's a pun here, a double entendre, civil blood makes civil hands unclean. So there's civil, the act of being civilized, the, the idea that you are sophisticated and educated and, and better than our Neanderthal pre predecessors, if I could talk, this would be so much better, predecessors. Uh, there's also civil, like the idea of civil war, which is not so nice. It just means that like a, a faction within a country, a city, or a group fighting against another faction, a division within the people. Um, that sort of civil war is far from civilized. It's often one of the most bloody civil wars that you can point to. 
up until just recently with the United States extended involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have only just now passed the number of casualties in war. If you add up all of the conflicts the United States has been involved with in its entire history, it has only now just passed the number of casualties that we had during the Civil War. Uh, similarly, the, the Irish War for Independence against the English in the, in the 1920s was followed by an Irish Civil War, and more Irish people died in the Irish Civil War than in their War for Independence. Uh, you can see just how quickly these things can become bloody and make even the civilest of hands unclean. They've got blood on their hands. They are guilty. All right, so the next quatrain. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. All right, so from forth the fatal loins of these two foes. So the foes is referring back to the two families that are fighting. Loins, uh, if you're talking about like a cut of meat, the tender loin comes from the inner thigh of an animal. All right. So from the inner thighs of these these warring families, a pair of star-crossed lovers. All right. So the children of these two families, what's going to happen to these two children? Well, spoiler alert, they're going to take their own lives. So right away, we know from the very onset, we've got two families that are fighting each other. Their children will become involved somehow, and they're going to become lovers. But what's going to happen to them by the end of this play, they will take their own lives. They will kill themselves. All right. Misadventured, piteous overthrows. So an adventure is you go out and you have a lot of fun. A misadventure is you go out and crazy things happen, but you don't exactly have a lot of fun. Piteous, same root as pitiful. And then overthrows is where like logic and reason overpower emotions or emotions overthrow our reason or the people overthrow their government. So something's being overthrown here and their deaths, their misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death, bury their parents strife, strife being hatred for, for someone else, suffering inflict, inflicted by hatred. Um, so Romeo and Juliet, when they kill themselves, it's actually going to apparently cause their parents to stop fighting with one another. Uh, not sure in real world it, it works that neatly. I don't know if we could bring about peace in the Middle East by having two young people fall in love and commit suicide. But once again, we have to suspend disbelief because this is drama. This is not reality. Okay. Final quatrain. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. So this ongoing hatred as the setting in which Romeo and Juliet's doomed love takes place, all right? Death marked is how it's referred to earlier. They're referred to as star-crossed. Um, to be star-crossed, those of you who, who follow astrology, you were born on this date, so you're a Gemini or a Libra or a Taurus or whatever it is. So therefore, this is what's going to happen to you. The idea that the stars under which we are born, because each one of those is an astrological sign, is somehow going to affect our lives. Um, it's all a bunch of hogwash, but that's a conversation for another day. Here, in the world that Shakespeare is building for us, there is fate. And Romeo and Juliet were fated because of the stars that they were born under, to fall in love and ultimately to kill themselves. And you could argue that given that the chorus tells us that this is fate, saying that they're doomed, saying that their love is death marked, no matter what they tried, no matter how hard they fought, this was what the outcome was going to be. Now that's entirely possible. We know this is a, a drama, this is a fictional construct. So it's not like the the characters inside of the story can get together and be like, screw you, author, we're going to do what we want. The author is the one who controls what happens. He exerts the, the inexorable hand of fate that pushes characters towards their end. Uh, that's an idea that, that needs to be kept in mind here. Although 
it's more entertaining, just like in real life, if we see these characters as individuals with agency, with the capacity to make decisions that will impact the world and impact the, the next choices that they have coming their way. So apparently the only thing that could end the, the fighting between these parents is the death of the children. The, the chorus tells us this, even though I think you can make the case based on some of the information that we're going to see later in this play, that it might not be true. Shakespeare never really gives you absolutes, never really gives you certainties. You have to be the director and the actor and make the action happen in your mind. And those decisions that you make, the parts that you emphasize or minimize, that's going to impact the way these things play out. And so you get to be the one who decides. Is it actually free will or are these characters just screwed from the beginning? Okay. This whole thing is going to take about two hours, so if you need to get up and use the bathroom, I'd encourage you to do it now. Finally, the witch, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. So you in the audience, all you have to do is just like try to listen patiently. You know it's going to take about two hours, but you already bought your ticket. You might as well take the ride. And if you do, Whatever that the chorus has said that didn't make any sense, hopefully these actors on stage will be able to make you understand. And that's it. That's the spoilers. We know the, the setting, the conflict, to some extent, the characters. Everything that we need to know in order to understand the action that's about to unfold has been told to us. We even know what the resolution is ultimately going to be for these characters and for these families. And Shakespeare is going to continually play upon our knowledge of those things in order to, to make jokes, insert humor, and also twist this incredibly painful knife of dramatic irony where we know something that the character doesn't. And we want to stand up and scream like, don't go in there, Romeo. But he's going to go in there anyway. We know what he doesn't. So let's get it going. All right. Act one, scene one. We're in Verona, Italy, a city, a public place. A lot of times it's portrayed as like the marketplace. It's a crowded and busy street. And here comes Samson and Gregory of the House of Capulet armed with swords and bucklers. A buckler is like a small shield. Uh, it's not going to give you a ton of protection, but in a place where you're not using heavy weapons and no one is wearing armor, it affords you a small amount of protection. And, and there's, there's some, some symbol here, the fact that Samson and Gregory are rolling through the marketplace strapped and ready for combat tells you that these families are, are going at it in the streets and that when they go out, they need to be ready to do the do. All right. Now, as Samson and Gregory move forward, you need to be aware. These are not the main characters of the play. Shakespeare loves to delay introducing the most important characters and use minor characters, especially early in his plays, to set the stage for the action that's going to take place. So here, to dramatize the conflict between the families, we start out with the armed Samson and Gregory in the marketplace. Now, the other thing that Shakespeare does here is he starts to play off with actually a ton of jokes. And the jokes, if you get them, help ease you into the action, help you with the suspension of disbelief. And it also helps Shakespeare do one of the things that makes him revolutionary. So the ancient Greeks, the, the first people who started putting actors on stage and having them pretend to be someone else, the, the first place in history that we have this kind of recorded, uh, at least in as far as Western history, um, the way this this worked was the ancient Greeks believed you could either be a, a great comedian in terms of the plays that you wrote, or you could be a great tragedian in terms of the plays that you wrote. You could write great comedies, you could write things that were really funny that had a happy ending and everyone living happily ever after, or you could write, write great tragedies that ended with a main character being destroyed and his entire life being destroyed. But you couldn't do both. One of the things that makes Shakespeare so remarkable is his ability to fuse 
these two things. We know from the onset, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy about two young lovers who are going to kill themselves. But on the way, Shakespeare's going to put as many jokes as he possibly can, and oftentimes as many body sex jokes and inappropriate jokes as he possibly can, in order to, to fuse comedy and tragedy into one, to break the rules of the ancient Greeks. So, Samson and Gregory walking through the marketplace, having a conversation. Once again, they start off with puns, these words that have double, ne not double meanings, <laughs> these words that sound like other words, and putting in the wrong word in the wrong place because of how it sounds versus what word actually belongs there. So the jokes get better as we move into this. The puns start off, they're a little bit tough to pick up, but on my word, Gregory, on my word will not carry coals. Now, what he means by this is like, we won't put up with any crap. We're not gonna take anybody talking trash to us. If somebody comes at us, we're gonna stand up and be men. All right, that's the opening lines of this play. And it's an idea that's going to be important throughout this play. What is a man? What makes someone a man? Samson and Gregory defined it, at least Gregory does, as the capacity to, to stand up and fight. I'm not so sure that's actually what makes somebody a man, but we'll see. Now, Gregory comes back with a pun. No, for then we should be colliers. Now, a collier is somebody whose job it was to carry coals from place to place. That was literally their job. And they helped provide heat and energy throughout the city. It was a dirty job. It was a hard job. And so, let's be honest, the, the best and the brightest people did not grow up to become colliers. And as such, the profession of being a collier was not respected. So... I mean, the, the conversation starts out, hey, look, Gregory, on my word, we're not going to put up with anybody's crap. No, because then we'd be the people who some families pay to come to their house and clean up the dog crap in the backyard. That's what it boils down to. Samson tries to, to be clear. No, I mean, and we be in collar, we'll draw. Collar, C-H-O-L-E-R, not a collier, but a collar. Collar means anger. All right, so if we get mad, we're going to draw. What he means by draw, pull out our swords and fight. Gregory has jokes for this. I, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. And you can take that a couple of ways. Collar, C-O-L-L-A-R, here we're talking about like the thing on your shirt. That's one way. So you're going to take your shirt off. That's probably not terribly helpful. This What would be more helpful as far as the joke he's probably trying to make is, you'll take your neck out of the collar, either the slave's collar, which would be an iron band worn around your neck, or a noose. You're the type of person who's someday going to be hung, and the only way you can save yourself is to draw your neck out of the collar. Now, Samson is going to go on trying to talk about what a great fighter he is. I strike quickly being moved, so you give me a reason, I'll hit you. Gregory's response to this is, this posturing is to tell his friend, but thou art not quickly moved to strike. So Gregory is talking about Samson, and some of us can probably identify with this, where someone might insult you, and then like 15 minutes later, then you get angry. Then you get mad. It's when you've had a chance to stew about it for a while. That's the type of person Samson is, according to Gregory. Samson, still trying to prop himself up as somebody who's a hard case, says, a dog of the house of Montagues moves me. So if I see one of those Montagues around here, then I'll be moved to fight. Gregory's response to that is, to move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runst away. And there's a couple of different jokes going on in here. So Samson is saying that a dog of the house of Montague will move me to fight. Gregory's response is, yeah, you might move, but to move is to run. So the only type of moving you do in a fight is if you run away. To be valiant is to stand, and that stand is a double entendre. It could mean plant your feet and stand still, or, and as we'll see, the humor here becoming increasingly sexual, once again, playing on this idea of man and manhood and what makes somebody a man. Well, 
it could mean to be valiant is to stand. He could be talking about an erection. There's no other way to say it. So right from the get-go, even though we've got this tragedy, we've got pretty body sex jokes starting to work their way into the conversation. Samson's retort is, a dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take to the wall any man or maid of the Montagues. All right. So he's talking about, I hope, stand in the sense of plant your feet and fight. All right. I'll take to the wall. I will fight them and push them up against the wall so they have nowhere to run. And I don't care if it's a man or a woman. And the reason why he throws that woman in there is because he's responding like, I'll fight the men and I'll have something else for these ladies that will stand up. Now, Gregory, hearing him talk about, I'll take him to the wall in terms of fighting, is now going to play off of one of the situations that was a problem in ancient Verona, I'm sure, and a problem in Shakespeare's own time. That shows the a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. Now, that probably doesn't make a ton of sense. The weakest, when he talks about that, he's talking about women. Women go to the wall, and what he means is, in ancient Verona or in ancient London or any other ancient civilization you want to point to, indoor plumbing hadn't been invented yet. So you had in Shakespeare's London and probably in ancient Verona what was referred to as a chamber pot, a metal pot that was kept usually under the bed where if you had to go number one or go number two, you went in that and then you threw it out the window into the street. Pretty disgusting. You can see why disease was such a horrible problem during Shakespeare's time. So this created the tradition which still carries to this day uh, if a man is a gentleman and he's walking with his lady, it is expected that if we're walking on the sidewalk, the gentleman will walk closer to the street and the lady will walk on the inside part of it. And this tradition actually dates back to Shakespeare's time. That way, and before I should say earlier than Shakespeare's time, that way if somebody is chucking their, their sewage out the window, it's less likely to hit the woman. She should probably have an umbrella as well. But that was the tradition. So when he says the weakest goes to the wall, he's saying, I knew it. Samson, you're a woman. Now, Samson laughs at this, and his comeback is true. And therefore, women, being the weaker vessels, are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore, I will push the Montague men from the wall and thrust his maids to the wall. So, so Samson's dragging it here, and he's doing a little bit much. He's saying like, okay, I know what you're saying, so here's what I'll do. When I'm fighting, I'll push the Montague men away from the wall, and I'll push those ladies up against the wall, maybe more than once if you catch his meaning here. All right? Now, Gregory is a bit shocked by this. Because, you know, talking about raping the women of the Montague house is not, it's not the way things are done. All right? Uh, in, in North City, St. Louis, where we had kids in different neighborhoods with different sets shooting each other. I don't know about anybody who raped anybody else from another neighborhood just for their hood. Like, that's not generally the way these sort of feuds are played, even today. So Gregory says, this quarrel is between our masters and us, their men. Like, whoa, dude. Slow down. Let's just keep it between the boys here. All right. Let's not get these ladies involved. Samson's like, tis all one. And I'll show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I shall be cruel with the maids and cut off their heads. The heads of the maids, asks Gregory. Aye, the heads of the maids or their maiden heads, take in what sense thou wilt. All right, all right. So when, when Gregory says we're only supposed to be fighting between men, Samson's response is, I don't give up. I don't care. They're all the same. And I'll show myself a tyrant. When I've beaten their men, I'll be cruel with their maids, their women, their young women, maid also being a, a, a colloquialism in Shakespeare's time for virgins. All right. I'll cut off their heads. Now, is he talking about decapitation or is he talking about something else? And it's what Gregory asks. Are you talking about cutting off the heads of the women? Because because this is just taking a whole much darker conversational turn than I think Gregory was anticipating. And now we see Samson making the joke that he means. Yes, I'll take the, the heads of the maids, meaning decapitation, or their maiden heads. 
maidenhead being the term for a woman's virginity. So once again, he's talking about, yeah, I'll either take their heads or I'll take their maiden heads. Either way, I'm good. Gregory gets the joke. He's like, well, they must take it in the sense that feel it. Don't think I need to explain that one. And then Samson's response is, me they shall feel while I'm able to stand. Coming back to that erection idea. And tis known, I'm a pretty piece of flesh. When he's talking about stand in the sense of the term that we talked about earlier and talking about how he's a pretty piece of flesh, what part of his flesh is he talking about? Yeah, you get the picture. Now, Gregory is back on his game. He knows what's going on here. He knows what Samson is talking about, and he's got jokes for that too. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou had been poor John. Now, in our modern understanding of language, that sentence makes no darn sense whatsoever. So back in the day, fish was one of the main foods that you could eat. It was a good source of protein. But what's the problem with fish? After a couple of days, it's not so good anymore. It starts to stink and rot and then be inedible. So fishermen had to come up with a way to preserve their meats. And one of the things that, that ancient Native Americans did and ancient people in Verona and ancient people in England is when they had meat and they had access to salt, what they could do is dry it and turn it into jerky. All right, so you cut it in thin strips, you salt it really, really heavily, and then you just lay it out on a rock in the sun, and gradually the meat will dry. And it won't be chewy, it won't be moist, it won't be tender, but it won't rot. You'll be jerky at that point. And poor John was the term in England during Shakespeare's time for fish jerky, essentially. So when Samson is talking about what a pretty piece of flesh he is, Gregory's response is, nah, man, you ain't no pretty piece of flesh. You're, you're salt. You're poor John. You are fish jerky. You are dried out, shriveled up. You ain't that big. But their jokes get interrupted. Draw thy tool. Here comes two of the house of Montagues. So get your sword out. Here comes a couple of those Montague dogs we were talking about fighting. Samson's response is, my naked weapon is out, quarrel, and I will back thee. So Samson draws his sword, but now we get to see, is he actually about that life? He's been talking this whole time about how rough and tough and ready to rock he is. And when the Montagues show up, what does he do? He pushes Gregory forward and says, go for it, man. I got your back. And when he says, I will back thee, Gregory says, how? Turn thy back and run? Yeah, you got my back. You got my way back. I'm worried about how far back you're going to be, and all of a sudden it's going to be me taking on two Montagues. Samson's response is, fear me not. Gregory's response to that is like, no, I'm not scared of you in a fight. I'm scared of you running away. I know, Mary, I fear thee. No, Mary, I fear thee. So Samson's follow-up is, let us take the law on our side let them begin. So I got the idea. Let's not start the fight. Let's let them start the fight. Gregory's like, all right, I will frown as I pass by and let them take it as they list. So Gregory's master plan is here. I'm going to mean mug them as I walk by and we'll see if they got anything to say. And then Samson's got going to take it up a notch. He's like, nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. Now, once again, you need to know a little bit about practices in ancient Verona. Biting your thumb at someone is the equivalent of flipping them off. And so what Samson is going to do is he's going to walk by, giving them the bird, showing that middle finger. And if they put up with it, that means they're cowards. And this is important. One of the most important things in all of Romeo and Juliet is the power of words. And here, just like that, sticking up your middle finger actually means words, certain words that start with the letter F and the letter Y. Like, there are words in that gesture. And those words have magical power. In ancient Verona, if someone insulted you and you did not fight them on the spot, 
That meant you were a coward. That meant you were a weakling. Words could transform you into either a fighter or a coward. Just words. Now, I'm not sure that's actually a healthy way to look at things, but that was the way the society of ancient Verona looked at it. All right. So Abraham and Balthazar of the House of Montague were strolling through the, the, the marketplace. And then here comes this guy strolling past him, biting his thumb. So Abraham's not the kind of man who's going to put up with that. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Samson's response is, I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? And then Samson steps aside and asks Gregory, is the law on our side if I say I? Okay, so Samson's walking by, flipping them off. Abraham sees this and asks him, you flipping me off? Samson's initial response is like, no, I'm just walking around with my middle finger sticking out. What's wrong with that? So Abraham asks him again, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? that explicit adding of the word sir so that he can say, hey, I was being respectful if the cops ask him how this all got started, but there's a way of saying sir that also carries an unspoken insult at the end of it. And you best believe when these guys are saying sir to each other, there's part of that. So Samson asked Gregory, if I say yes, is the law gonna be on our side? Gregory's answer, no. So Samson can't say, yes, I'm biting my thumb at you. So instead he says, no, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir, but I do bite my thumb, sir. So nope, just walking around, got my middle finger sticking out. It's a condition. I don't know, it's weird. But once again, everybody in the marketplace will see, here come a couple of, couple of these Capulets flipping off the Montagues, and they didn't do anything about it. Those Montagues must be soft, all right? So Gregory who's itching a little bit to try to push this to the next level, asks him, asks Abraham, do you quarrel, sir? You got a problem? Abraham's response says, quarrel, sir? No, sir. And now Samson's going to step it up. If you do, sir, I am for you. So if you want to fight, I'll fight. I serve as good a man as you. My master is just as good as your master. Abraham's response to that is, no better. Yeah, your master... The Capulet is definitely no better than my master, the Montague. Samson's got no response to that. Well, sir. And then Gregory gets in his ear and says, Say better, here comes one of my master's kinsmen. So, Gregory is looking past Abraham, and he sees somebody else coming through the crowd. And he thinks, oh, it's another one of our squad. Go ahead, say better. Turn this fight up a notch. Pretty soon it's going to be three on two. So Samson turns it up and says, yes, better, sir. So my master is better than your master. Abraham's not going to put up with that insult. You lie. Samson's response says, draw if you be men. Gregory, remember thy swashing blow. Your slashing blow. So they start to fight. Now, whenever this is staged, they almost always switch up the houses between Abraham and Gregory because they're not trying to confuse the audience. But there's a joke in this. Gregory and Samson, when they see that man moving through the crowd and they think it's their squad guy, it's actually somebody on the other squad. So the first person who comes on stage next is actually House Montague. So now it's actually Montague's three, Capulet's two, as Benvolio comes on stage. But interestingly, Benvolio, despite giving his team the larger numbers, doesn't just jump in and continue the fight. He sees the servants of both house fighting, and he tries to break it up. Part fools, put up your swords. You know not what you do. Something I still say in the halls of Central when I'm trying to break up a fight. People are like, whoa, that's Shakespeare. We better stop fighting. That's what I do. That's why I'm a leader among men. But Benvolio breaks up the fight. He beats down their swords. He draws his own sword not to kill anyone, but to slap other people's swords down. And that tells you something about Benvolio. He wants peace, apparently. He wants peace so bad, he'll draw his sword and fight for it. 
which is interesting given the character we're about to meet next. As Benvolio is beating down the swords of the combatants, Tybalt of House Capulet comes on stage. What? Art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon thy death. So Tybalt, when he walks on stage, what does the action look like to him? He sees three Montagues attacking two Capulets. So it looks like the Montagues ran up and started something here. Now Tybalt's not going to put up with that. But Tybalt, once again, is going to take this to the next level. There were two ways to fight back in the day. You could fight but not really try to hurt each other. That way you just got to put on this masculine show, this big display, and everybody knew you weren't a coward, but also nobody was really going to get hurt. On the other hand, you could fight for blood. You could fight trying to kill people. Tybalt is letting everybody know he's going for blood. So Benvolio, are you drawn among these heartless hinds? You have your sword out among the servants. Turn around and look upon your death. Fight me. Now Benvolio, who tells the truth here, says, I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword or manage it to part these men with me. Like, look, man, I'm not trying to fight. I'm trying to stop a fight. Tybalt didn't have that. What? Drawn and talk of peace. I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Have at thee, coward. And then they start fighting. So, Tybalt, not the kind of man, based on his words and his actions, who will listen to reason. He is driven by hatred, driven by anger, just as Benvolio is driven by peace. Each one of them is what in literature we call a foil. F-O-I-L. And what the term actually comes from is jewelry. If you've ever seen a woman's wedding band, oftentimes there is a, a gold or a white gold or a silver or whatever type of band it might be with normally a diamond prominently displayed. And the way they elevate that diamond up above the rest of the ring so that it shines, so that it sparkles, is they put these prongs coming up from the band. Those prongs are called a foil, F-O-I-L. What that means is it elevates the stone, the main focal point of the jewel. And characters in literature can do this exact same thing. Tybalt, as a man of action, as a man of anger, as a man of, of violence and rage, is here to elevate our understanding of a different character. Benvolio, as a man of peace, as a man of inaction, as a man of, of trying to calm things down, is here to elevate another character. I'll give you 10 seconds to try to guess what character they're trying to show off. His name is in the title of the play. So as the fight continues, it escalates. Soon more servants start coming on stage from each side and joining the fight. Then the citizens come in with clubs. This is sort of like the town watch, the, uh, the, the, the neighborhood watch program catches word that there's like Capulets and Montagues fighting in the streets. And this is what they say as they come in and start whacking people with clubs. Clubs, bills, and partisans strike, beat them down, down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. So you've got the Montagues who hate the Capulets and the Capulets who hate the Montagues. And then you've got the rest of the citizens of Verona. And how do they feel? They hate them both. In fact, they want to kill them both. So the now you've got a full-scale riot in the marketplace. Capulet versus Montague, citizen versus both. Everybody's just going for this free-for-all and it's chaos. As the chaos continues, old man Capulet, the leader of the Capulet household, in his gown, in his like dressing shirt, in his nightgown, comes out with Lady Capulet. And old man Capulet says, what noise is this? Give me my longsword, ho! So old man Capulet, even though he's still in his pajamas, is like, woman, get me my sword. But there's something interesting happening here. Lady Capulet has quite the interesting response to her husband. What noise is this? 
a crutch, a crutch. Why call you for a sword? So do you need a long sword, old man Capulet? No, you need a crutch. What's she saying about him? Yeah, he's, he's too old to be fighting in these streets. I'm not going to bring you your sword. I'll bring you a crutch. I'll bring you a cane, old man. Now, that's a pretty saucy way for a woman to treat her husband in, the, in this street. Right? And that tells you something, though, about the power dynamic of the Capulet household. Now, you'll see marriages back in the day were very different from marriages of today. A lot of times, especially for rich men, they would choose to marry very young women. The reason for that would be so that they could, in theory, maximize her childbearing years. The idea, and we'll see this played out later on in this scene, was that as soon as a girl had her first period, she was old enough to marry because she was old enough to conceive children. That was the way the logic went at the time, which they kind of had to do because there was such a high mortality rate for the entire population. I mean, the average age during Shakespeare's time, and I'm sure it was even worse during ancient Verona's times, was about 35 years old. 50% of all children never reached their 10th birthday. So high infant mortality rate, high child mortality rate, high adult mortality rate, rate meant that you had to maximize the number of babies you could produce. And that led to some kind of interesting power dynamics after the couple had been married for several decades. The husband would move into old age. The wife would still be young and in her prime. And here, at least it seems, Lady Capulet is the one shutting down her husband in public. So this Capulet says, my sword, I say, old Montague is come and flourishes his blade in spite of me. So he sees old man Montague out there. He's like, I see him fighting. Let me go. Montague and Lady Montague come on stage. And Montague starts yelling, thou villain Capulet, hold me not. Let me go. Uh, I always kind of like to imagine this as no one's actually holding him back. You ever seen somebody who's in a fight or about to get in a fight? And they like, hold me back, bro. Hold me back, cuz. Because they don't actually want to fight. But Lady Montague actually checks her husband again saying thou shalt not stir a foot to seek a foe like you aren't going out there once again you're too old to bang in these streets now amid all of this foolishness the prince shows up and we've talked about the power of language the power of words real power resides in the prince his power is his words are law and now he's gonna flex that power on all these people, the Montagues, the Capulets, and the citizens themselves. Here's what he has to say. Rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighbor stained steel. Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts that quench the fire of your pernicious rage with purple fountains issuing from your veins. On the pain of torture from those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your moved prince. So profaners of this neighbor stained steel. Um, to be profane is to, to speak in foul language, to, to do something that is disrespectful in the extreme, right? Neighbor stained steel. How can you stain steel on your neighbor? Well, if you get their blood all over it, congratulations. Even if it's stainless steel, you're gonna have to wash that crap off, all right? And even at that, they keep fighting. So the prince then has to step up. He insults them, you beasts that quench the fire of your pernicious rage in the purple fountains issuing from your veins. How can blood be purple? Do y'all know? Blood in, in the movies and everything and on TV is always red, but it actually matters where you get cut. Blood that's traveling towards the heart in one of those main arteries that doesn't have much oxygen in it is blue or purple. Blood that's traveling away from the heart that is oxygenated, that's red. So this purple blood means like people's arteries are getting clipped and you clip an artery, especially in this day and age, you're gonna die. So there are casualties taking place here. And then how's the prince finally gonna make them listen? On pain of torture, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground. 
So drop your weapons or I won't just lock you up. I'm going to torture you. I got guys who like to hurt people and I'll let them spend some time hurting you. So you better stop fighting. And I mean now. And at that, the warriors set down their weapons. Now, the prince is pissed. Three civil brawls. Ed, bred of an angry word by the old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield partisans in hand as old, cankered with peace to part your cankered hate. So, Capulet, Montague, this is all your fault. This is now the third riot I've had to break up because y'all want to fight in these streets. And your fighting in the streets isn't just killing off Capulets and Montagues. If it was, I might be willing to just step aside and say whatever. But now you've got my own citizens, the citizens of Verona, old people of Verona, picking up old weapons in their age-spotted hands to come up and try to break up your fights. Shame on you. So here's what we're going to do. If ever you disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. So I'll just make it simple for you. You guys fight in these streets again, I'll kill you. You will be executed. In fact, if your underlings, your servants fight in these streets, I'm going to kill you. So not only will I execute anybody who fights in my streets, I'll execute the heads of the families for letting them fight in these streets. Do you see how that's going to maybe motivate Capulet and Montague to squash this beef? For this time, all the rest depart away. So I'm going to let you guys go for right now. You, Capulet, shall go along with me and Montague come you this afternoon to know the further pleasure in, our further pleasure in this case. To old Freetown, our common judgment place, once more on pain of death, all men depart. So Prince breaks up the fight, tells everybody they need to stand down. If they fight in these streets again, I'm gonna kill them. Capulet, I'm gonna hear your side of the story right now. Montague, I'm gonna talk to you separately later. Now let's go. Everybody else, go home. So Capulet leaves with the prince. Everybody else leaves except for Benvolio, Lady Capulet. I'm sorry, Lady Montague and Old Man Montague. So Montague now turns to Benvolio. And there's layers of understanding here. One of the things we'll talk about is characterization. How do we learn about people in books or in plays or in real life? And three things you can always pay attention to if you want to learn about somebody, whether it's in something you're watching, something you're reading, or some way you're living. You can look at what they say, look at what they do, and then look at what other people say about them. And we're going to get all three types of things here in this scene. With Benvolio, we've got actions, him slapping down the people's swords. We've got words, him telling Tybalt he doesn't want to fight. They're going to talk about another character here, and it's going to give us some characterization for them as well. So Montague turns to Benvolio and says, Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew, were you by when it began? And that maybe tells us something about Benvolio. If your parents break up a fight, and then they point at you and say, Who started this? What's the implication there? The implication there is you started this. They fully expect that truth answer to be borne out by your response. But Benvolio is going to tell the story and he might selectively omit a few details, but he does tell the truth. Here were the servants of your adversary and yours close fighting ere I did approach. So look, the fight was started before I even got here. I drew to part them. But in the instant came the fiery Tybalt with sword prepared, which, as he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung his head about and cut the winds, who, nothing hurt withal, hissed him with scorn. So look, the fight was already happening before I got here. I drew my sword to break up the fight. As I was breaking up the fight, Tybalt shows up with his sword already out, and he attacks me. And then he gets a little bit of a shot against Tybalt here. What is it? 
What does it mean if somebody cuts the wind? Somebody breaks wind, what is it? That's what he has to say about Tybalt's swordsmanship. The wind hisses if you've ever swung anything through the, the air with any amount of speed, like a baseball bat, it makes a whoosh sound. Well, Tybalt, when he swung his swords, the air was like which is a universal sound of disapproval. While we were interchanging thrusts and blows, came more and more and fought on part and part till the prince came, who parted either part. So more and more people kept coming, more and more people getting involved, and then the prince came and he parted all of it. Right? So everybody did their part until the prince came and pushed everybody apart. And that's where you come in. Now, interestingly, Lady Montague, who's heard Benvolio's version of events, says, Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him today? Right glad I am. He was not at this fray. Now, I always thought that was weird. Benvolio just got done having a major fight in a riot in the streets of Verona. And what's Lady Capulet's first question for him? Where's Romeo? Thanks, Lady Capulet. I'm fine. Now, there's also some characterization here that we could read into Lady Montague's words. Why would she be worried about Romeo? Well, there's a couple of ways you can take it. Like one, either Romeo's soft and doesn't know how to fight, and she's worried that if he was at this fight, he could have gotten hurt. Or maybe Romeo's the kind of guy who gets involved in these types of fights a lot. Maybe he's always out there in these streets like Tibble. We don't know as an audience. All we know is what the characters say about Romeo to learn about him. Now, Benvolio happily can say Romeo was not at the fight, but he has seen Romeo recently, and that's what he's about to recount to Lady Montague. Madam, an hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east, which is a long way of saying, as the, before the sun came up, a troubled mind drove me to walk abroad. I couldn't sleep, so I went for a walk. Where, under the grove of sycamore west, that westward rooteth on the city's side, so early walking did I see your son. I couldn't sleep. I went for a walk. I ended up walking all the way out of the city to where the trees grow on the side of the hill. And while I was there, I saw Romeo. Which is a little weird. It was weird I was out of bed. Definitely weird that... I was out of bed and then I run into somebody I know, let alone Romeo. Towards him I made, but he was aware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. So I went up to say hi to him, but when he saw me coming, he ran away and hid in the woods. Kind of weird. I mean, Benvolio is Romeo's blood relative. If you saw like one of your relatives in the streets and they like were waving to you and calling your name, would you turn around and run? That's what Romeo did. Romeo's acting a little weird here. I, measuring his affections as by my own, that are most busied when they are most alone, pursued my humor not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. So I didn't chase after him. I could see he didn't want to be around me. Honestly, I didn't really want to be around him. So I just let him run away. So what's up with that? So Montague is not shocked by what Benvolio has seen. In fact, he's about to impart some information that makes him say, that tells us in the audience that this is actually a pattern of behavior with Romeo. Many a morning hath he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning dew, adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs. So Romeo's been doing this for a while. And if any of you guys have gone to bed late enough or gotten home early enough you've put your hands down on that grass before the sun comes up you know it's usually wet with dew but the grass around romeo is extra wet because not only is there dew but there's also romeo's tears so romeo's been doing this for a while he goes out and cries and sighs all night long but all so soon as the all-cheering sun should in the furthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from aurora's bed so as soon as the sun comes up, away from the light steals home my heavy son, and private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, 
and makes himself an artificial knight. So as soon as the sun starts to come up, Romeo comes running home, locks his door, locks his windows, pulls his curtains, and I can only assume cries and sighs a whole lot more. Black and portentous must this humor prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. So this is bad, and it looks like it could get worse. And Montague is worried about his son. He's acting depressed, and he's worried that if someone can't talk to Romeo and help him out, something bad could happen to Romeo. Now Benvolio probes a little deeper. My noble uncle, do you not know the cause? I neither know it nor can learn of him. And this is another example of the way maybe people haven't changed since Shakespeare's time. You guys are teenagers. Even if you are in the deepest of deep depressions, when you are at your most sad and your parents ask you what's wrong, what inevitably is the reply? Nothing. Yeah, that was true in Shakespeare's time, too. Romeo is clearly depressed. His dad has been asking him what's wrong. and Romeo won't talk to him. Have you importuned him by any means? Have you tried to figure it out? Both by myself and by many other friends. But he, his own affections counselor, is to himself. I will not say how true, but to himself, so secret and so close, so far from sounding and discovery. As is the bud bit with the envious worm, ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air, or delicate sun, his be or delicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, which we as willingly could give cure as no. So I've tried. I've tried talking to him. I've tried getting other people to talk to him, but he's not talking to anybody. And I'm scared. I'm scared that he's in the same situation as a flower, that when the worm gets inside of it, before it has a chance to open, the flower dies. And I'm scared that's what's going to happen to my son. He's got something inside of him that's eating him up. And I'm worried it could kill him. If we could just figure out what was wrong with him, we could try to help him. But he won't talk to us. And as they're talking about him, here comes Romeo walking on stage. Benvolio's got an idea. See where he comes, so please you, step aside. I'll know his grievance or be much denied. Oh, I would thou wert so happy by thy stay to hear true shrift. Come, madam, let's away. So Benvolio's like, I got this. Y'all back up out of here. I'm going to talk to Romeo and I'll find out what's bothering him or I'll make him tell me shut the hell up and leave me alone a lot. All right, Montague is like, good luck, man. I hope you can get his true shrift. And that's a key word as this goes on. Shrift, S-H-R-I-F-T, is like the old school short word for confession. Now, those of you who are Catholic um, know that the practice of confessing one's sins is a, a sacrament. Uh, uh, you go to a priest and you say the magic words and you tell the priest all the horrible things that you've done in order to get your sins forgiven in order to be given penance, a way to make up for your sins. Uh, similarly, in other veins of Christianity, if in your heart you make a true confession of your sins to God, and you're truly sorry, and you give up the, the bad things that you've gotten through your sins, you can be forgiven. This idea of confession, again, the power of words to relieve our guilt. Well, Benvolio, Good luck. Hear Romeo's confession. And hopefully, you can lighten his soul. No pressure. Montague and Lady Montague leave. And Benvolio says, Good morrow, cousin, which is an old school way of saying good morning, cousin. Now, Romeo is surprised. Is the day so young? But new struck nine. Ay, me. Sad hours seem long. Was that my father that went hence so fast? Now, Romeo clearly is still depressed. Somebody comes up to him and says, good morning. Romeo's response is like, Geez, it's still morning. 
God, time goes by slow when you're sad. Was that my dad who just left? It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which having makes them short. Now, that's a weird, weird phrase sentence, but we all know the expression, what flies when you're having fun? Time. And so then the inverse is true. If you're not having fun, what happens to time? It slows down. Now, Benvolio is not just asking questions. He's thinking along with Romeo, trying to figure out what's wrong with him. And when he says not having that, which having makes them short, he knows he's not just talking about fun. He's talking about in love, out of love out of her favor where I am in love. So Romeo isn't hiding from Benvolio. Benvolio asks him, why are you acting so sad? What's making your hours so long? And Romeo says, I don't have what I want. You want love, asks Benvolio. I'm out of love, says Romeo. I'm out of the favor with the person I love. So Romeo loves somebody, but she doesn't love him. Alas, that love, so gentle in his view, should be so tyrannous and rough in proof. So Benvolio's like, yeah, man, I hear you. Isn't it messed up that love, who people always like in paintings and statues paint as this like angelic figure, a beautiful baby, a loving woman. When actually you meet it, man, it's mean and rough. Love hurts, man. I'm sorry. So Romeo hits on that idea, thinking about Cupid, the way Cupid is depicted as this like little baby with wings and a blindfold. And it's so cute on Valentine's Day, but really love hurts. He hits on this idea, alas, that love whose view is muffled still should without eyes see pathways to his will. So yeah, it sucks. Love is blind and it hurts. Then he tries to change the subject. Where shall we dine? And as he looks around, he's like, oh, me. What fray was here? He sees that like clearly a riot has taken place in the marketplace. Like there's stuff knocked over, blood on the ground, probably a couple of bodies hanging out. And then before Benvolio can answer him, he's like, yet tell me not for I've heard it all. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. And now Shakespeare through Romeo is, is telling us something here that I think is still true. It was true in Shakespeare's time and before it's still true about people to this day that actually love and hate are a lot more alike than they are different. Have you ever had like a person say an insult to you and you didn't really care about that person? Did it matter to you? If I'm walking down the street and some random stranger is like, you suck. I'm like, whatever, and I keep it moving. On the other hand, have you ever been hurt by somebody that you care about? had somebody that you respected or loved who said mean things to you, how much that hurts, how much you internalize that. Love and hate. In order to truly hate someone or something, you have to care about that person or that thing. You have to care about that person with passion and intensity, just like love. To truly hate something, truly hate someone, you're thinking about that person all the time. Just like if you truly love them. So Romeo starts using oxymoron, putting two words next to each other that should cancel each other out, but instead describe something. So jumbo shrimp. How can something be jumbo and a shrimp? Well, it's just a big shrimp. So these two words that should cancel each other out still describe. Similarly, Romeo is going to use those and paradoxes, logical impossibilities to try to describe this condition in which love and hate are actually really close together. Why then, O oh brawling love, O oh loving hate, O oh anything of nothing first create, O oh heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, Feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still walking sleep. That is not 
what it is. This love I feel that feel no love in this. So Romeo walks around, he sees the destruction in the marketplace, and he's like, this is love. And you can project from this a, a little bit more of an understanding into the fighting between the Capulets and the Montes. Maybe these families were close. And that's why the insult from one group to the other turned so violent and so passionate. But as Romeo's going through his list of oxymoron and paradoxes, it's usually played that Benvolio, who hearing this nonsense, is like, whatever, and starts laughing a little bit. And so Romeo catches him doing it. He's like, dost thou not laugh? You laughing at me? Now Benvolio, who's, remember, still trying to find out what's going on inside of Romeo emotionally, can't, can't be like, yeah, I'm laughing at you. You're making no darn sense. Instead, he's got to be like, uh, no, cause I, I rather weep. I'm so sad hearing you're so sad. Now, Romeo in his depression is like, oh God, I knew it. Not only am I depressed, but I'm depressing other people around me. Good heart at what? And Benvolio plays into it at thy good heart's oppression. I'm sad because you're sad. And Romeo's like, yeah, man, that's what love does to people. Why, such is love's transgression. That's love's sin. Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, which thou wilt propagate to have it pressed with more of thine. So if you keep talking to me, man, it's only going to make you feel worse. This love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to much of my own. So, and me being sad, knowing that I'm making you sad, is making me sadder. So, Benvolio, not helping here, dude. Love is a smoke raised with the fume of sighs, being purged a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed a sea nourished with lovers' tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall, and a preserving sweet. Farewell, my cuz. So it's like, yep, even your love for me, asking me these questions, caring about me, is making you sad, which is in turn making me sad. And this is why love sucks. So yeah, love is smoke that gets in your eyes, a fire that sparkles, a sea and a storm, and what else? It is madness most discreet. It's craziness, it's madness, but it's a madness that doesn't always show itself. It's a gall, it's, it's that, if you've ever like had like a hiccup burp where some stuff came up from your stomach and all of a sudden in your mouth you can taste that pizza and orange juice at the same time, back in the day they thought that was gall. And that gall was what made you angry. It was the chemical inside of you that was made by your spleen that made you want to fight and be angry. And that you could taste it when it came into your mouth with that bitterness. And that's part of what it was. It's a choking gall. That's what love is. But it's also a preserving sweet. And there's a couple of ways you can look at that. Like back in the day, candy making was pretty primitive, but they had sugar and they had the capacity to make candy. And so like a hard candy, a preserving sweet, that might be what Shakespeare is talking about. But whenever I think about like the idea of preserving sweets, there was also like a practice that Shakespeare probably knew about in embalming where using sugar could be used to preserve bodies. Uh, there was actually a famous story about Mad King Herod. Uh, those of you, once again, with Christian background probably have heard that name before. He's the one who was the king down around Palestine Way, who, when he heard that a new king was coming among the Jews, ordered all of the, the children being born within a certain set of years to be murdered in order to maintain his hold on the crown. And that wasn't the only time he did something crazy. For years, the story goes, when his, his first wife died, who he loved, he ordered her body to be embalmed in honey, preserved with honey, and then he would sleep with her every night. That's what love is in Romeo's mind. And so, 
farewell, my cuz. So, all right, man, I'm out of here. I'm only bringing you down, too. But Benvolio's like, I can't let you go yet. I don't know what's wrong with you yet, and I promised your dad I'd find out. So he says, soft, I will go along, and if you leave me so, you do me wrong. So, dude, I'm going with you, and if you try to ditch me, you're messed up, and you got me messed up. Romeo says, tuts, I have lost myself. I am not here. This is not Romeo. He is some other where. So this is another idea you'll actually hear echoed in some of Shakespeare's other plays. Like, whatever is being disrespectful to you is not me. I'm not even here right now. It's something else. It's my madness, if you will. It's my love that's actually making me act this way. And I'm sorry, Benvolio. So Benvolio cast him. So tell me in sadness... Who is it that you love? So what's her name, dude? And then Romeo's like, ah, oh, what, shall I groan and tell thee? Because if you're bummed out over the fact that somebody you like doesn't like you back, do you want to talk about them to your friends? Like, does that help? Like, I can't imagine that's something I would personally want to do. And Romeo's like, dude, are you going to make me groan and say her name? I don't want to say her name. And Benvolio, once again, with, with double meanings, grabs hold of that idea of groan. And sometimes there's groans of sorrow. And with later things that you'll learn about in human growth and development, there can be groans of pleasure. And so Benvolio's like, groan? Why no? But sadly, tell me who. Now, Romeo still doesn't want to talk about this girl. Bid a sick man in sadness make his will. Ah, word ill urged to one that is so ill. Now, Romeo is, is punning on the word ill here, the, the, the double meanings for the same sounds. To be ill, which is bad, or to be ill, to feel sick. So imagine, if you will, that you're dying. And you know you're dying. Would it make you feel better if your relatives like popped up and were like, hey, just came to see you. And by the way, would you make out your last will and testament? Because we want to know who gets your stuff. Would that make you feel better? That's how Romeo feels trying to have Benvolio talk to him about his problems. Like, I don't want to talk about my problems. You're just making me feel worse. So he tries to say, in sadness, cousin, I do love a woman. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so Benvolio is like, well, duh. I aimed so near when I supposed you loved. Yeah, I got that. You love a woman. Who is it? A right good mark, man. And she's fair that I love. And then Benvolio grabs a hold of Romeo's words here. A right fair mark, cause is soonest hit. So... I love a woman. Well, I was aiming at that when that was what I said. And then it was like, Romeo's like, yeah, you hit it. And she's beautiful too. Now they're talking about love and aim and hitting things. And, and when people are inquiring as to personal relationships and they're asking you, so did you hit it? That's what Benvolio is talking about when he says a right fair mark cause is soonest hit. So did you hit that? And Romeo has some words to say about that. Well, in that hit you miss, she will not be hit with Cupid arrows. She has Diane's wit. So in that hit you miss, no, I haven't hit it. She will not be hit with Cupid's arrow. So she won't fall in love. She has Diane's wit. Diana, the Roman name for Artemis, the goddess of the moon and dun, 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 virginity. Now we start to see a little bit about what Romeo thinks love is. And in strong proof of chastity, well armed from love's weak, childish bow, she lives unharmed. So Cupid can't hit her with the arrow of love. And she is vowed to live in chastity. Now, for those of you who don't know, chastity is the maintenance of one's virginity. So this woman that Romeo wants doesn't want him because she wants to stay a virgin. Now, 
It's been a while since I was on the dating scene, but the last time I checked, that wasn't a bad thing in a woman. <laughs> but for Romeo, it's got him seriously depressed. What does that tell us about how Romeo sees love? In Romeo's mind, what is love? Love is sex. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor ope her lap to saint seducing gold. So yeah, she won't give me any play at all. She won't listen to my love poetry. She won't let me stare into her eyes. She won't open her lap to saint seducing gold. And there's another double meaning there. There's a sexual meaning going on there as well. So she won't take his money is one way of putting it. But the other thing is like there was a story uh, in Greek mythology of a woman whose husband was very jealous of her. And so he kept her locked in a cage at all times, but she was beautiful. And despite the fact that she was locked in a cage, men would still try to come and hook up with her, including Zeus, king of the gods. And where all other men failed, Zeus succeeded because he transformed himself into a beam of shining light and shone upon her lap. Next thing you know, despite the fact that she was in a cage, she was pregnant. And so once again, Romeo in all of these terms is talking about equating love and sex. Oh, she's rich in beauty, only poor that when she dies, that with beauty dies her store. So it just, it's terrible. And I'm so sad, says Romeo, that she's committed her life to being a virgin. And that means that when she dies, there won't be any children to carry her beauty forward. And how do we make children? Well, we have sex. And that's really what Romeo wants. That's what Romeo thinks love is. That's why Romeo's depressed. He's crying and sighing all night long because he can't have sex. Now, Benvolio is shocked when he hears this. Apparently, it was something uh, less than normal for a woman to actually be intent on maintaining her virginity. Then she hath sworn that she will live chaste so she's not giving up, not to anybody. And Romeo's response is, she hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste. For beauty starved with her severity cuts beauty off from all posterity. So yeah, she's saving herself, and in that saving, she's wasting herself. She's cutting off her beauty from future generations because she won't make any babies. She's too fair, too wise, wisely too fair to merit bliss by making me despair. So she's too into herself. She's too smart for herself. And in her conservation, she's making me sad. She hath forsworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead that live to tell it now. So she won't sleep with him. And it's got Romeo so depressed he wishes he was dead. It's really hard to like Romeo in this play. It really is. And this conversation wherein we first meet Romeo and we first get to understand him makes him, for me, incredibly hard to like. He equates love with sex. And the fact that this girl won't sleep with him in his mind means she doesn't love him. And then we find out, actually, it's not just Romeo she says she won't sleep with. She won't sleep with any man. So apparently she's preparing herself for some sort of holy life. But Romeo, despite the fact that she's a good and noble woman, is so sad that she won't make babies. And that's really what has him depressed. Not that she won't sleep with me, but that she won't make any babies for posterity. Hmm. Something tells me Romeo's not being altogether honest here. But Benvolio offers up that time-honored solution to any time one of your friends is depressed about a girl. He says, be ruled by me. Forget to think of her. So just don't think about her. Now, does that advice ever work? 
Well, no, because if you're really into somebody, or even if you're not really into somebody, if I tell you not to think about something, what do you immediately think about? In the movie Inception, they show you this. It's like, when I say, don't think of elephants, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Elephants. If I go to the free throw line, and I'm thinking, don't miss it, don't miss it, don't miss it, what am I going to do? I'm going to miss it, because in order to not do something, you first have to think of that something. So Romeo's response is, oh, teach me how I should forget to think. When my brain is on, the only thing I can think of is this girl. So Benvolio's got the next step. All right, by giving liberty unto thine eyes, examine other beauties. So let's go look at other girls. Then Romeo's like, tis the way to call hers exquisite in question more. These haspy masks, let me try that again. These happy masks that kiss fair lady's brows, being black, puts in mind they hide the fair. He that is stricken blind cannot forget the precious treasure of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair and what her beauty serve, but as a note where I may read who's passing that passing fair. So even if I go out and look at other beautiful women, all they're going to do is remind me of how much more beautiful the woman I can't have is. John Lee Hooker would hit upon this in one of his blues songs later. Is every time I see a woman, all I do is think of her. Once again, we haven't really changed that much in 500 years. Farewell. Thou cannot teach me to forget. But as Romeo walks away, Benvolio says, I'll pay that doctrine or else die in debt. So, dude, I am going to get you into some other woman or I'm going to die trying. And then he walks out after Romeo. So we know Romeo is depressed. We don't actually know who he's depressed about. I'm sure a lot of us our first time through it. We're thinking it's probably Juliet. We'll see if that's the case as the play goes on. But we cut away from that scene with Benvolio talking to, to Romeo and we jump to the Capulet house. Old man Capulet has wrapped up his meeting with the prince and now he's walking and having conversation with another man named Paris. So let's see what they're talking about. Usually this is played as we catch up with the conversation after it's been going for a while. So Paris and Capulet have been going back and forth for a while and we get just the end of the conversation because it's the most important part. Capulet begins. But Montague is bound as well as I in penalty alike and tis not hard I think for men so old as, so old as we to keep the peace. So they're talking about the beef between the Capulets and the Montagues, and actually Capulet hair is pretty optimistic. The Prince is putting both the Capulets and the Montagues on the same warning. We face the same penalties, and honestly, we are both old. My wife's not wrong. We should be able to keep the peace. And Paris is in agreement. And not surprising, Paris is actually related to the prince, so of course he's going to back up what the prince has to say. Of honorable reckoning are you both, and pity tis you've lived at odds so long. So yeah, man, it sucks that you guys have been fighting each other for so long. You guys are both respectful families, and respectable families, and I, I, I hope that the peace will keep. And then Paris changes the subject to what he really wants to talk about. But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? S-U-I-T. Now, this is not suit in terms of, like, the clothes I'm wearing. And it has the same root as, like, lawsuit. My petition, my question, my pursuit. Specifically, my pursuit of your daughter. Uh, one of the books we didn't get to this year was the Iliad, not the Iliad, I'm sorry, the Odyssey, in which this guy Odysseus has been gone from his wife for 20 years, and he's a king. And while he's gone, all these other suitors show up trying to put the moves on his wife so that they can take over and become king. Suit, suitor, he's chasing after Capulet's daughter, trying to marry her. Now, Capulet, when he hears Paris ask this question, his response is, 
But saying over what I have said before, my child is yet a stranger to this world. She has not seen the change of fourteen years. Let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think she's ripe to be a bride. So there's a lot of debate. Typically, English teachers like to point to Juliet and say she's 14 years old. And I think that's actually making it cleaner than what it really is, more acceptable to our modern standards than what it really is. What does Capulet say there? My child is but a stranger in this world, so she's too young is what she's saying. And then he gives her age. She has not seen the change of 14 years. She's not 14 yet. And then he goes on to say, let two more summers wither in their pride. So let, let's let wait two more summers. Let's wait two more years. So if we do the math there, he seems to be indicating Juliet's 12. And here's Paris trying to marry her. Now, that seems repugnant, I hope, to our modern sensibilities, but the thing you got to keep in mind in Shakespeare's time and earlier times, once again, marriage for women was expected to take place young in order to maximize those childbearing years. And Paris, in reply to Capulet kind of shutting him down, saying, I want my daughter to wait two more years, he says, younger than she are happy mothers made. So look, you know, she's not that young. Younger girls than her get married all the time and have babies, which is kind of messed up. If that means that we're taking now and 11 is marrying age, that's in a way even worse to my modern sensibilities. But that's Paris's argument. Capulet's responses and too soon marred are those so early made. So, you know what, that might be what other people do, but I think that's wrong, and I'm not going to let that happen to my daughter. So you can do some characterization here. Does old man Capulet care about his daughter? Heck yeah, he does. Here he's got a relative to the prince saying he wants to marry his daughter, and Capulet is saying no. And here's why. The earth hath swallowed all my hopes, but she, she is the hopeful lady of my earth. When he says the earth hath swallowed all my hopes, but she, what does he mean by that? How does the earth swallow a human being? What is that even? Oh, he's had other kids. What happened to them? They died and he had to bury his own children and she's the only one that lived. And so now all of his hopes for the future rest in her. So he's going to be very careful with her and who he lets her marry. And as you'll see with the second part, who he wants to let her marry isn't even the most important part of the conversation. But woo her gentle Paris, get her heart. And my will to her consent is but a part. And she agree within the scope of choice lies my consent and fair according voice. So I tell you what, Paris, woo her, chase her, court her, talk to her. And if she decides she loves you and she wants to get married to you, I'm okay with that. But it will require her consent. And in this, Capulet's way ahead of his time. The idea of women being allowed to choose who they marry was pretty rare. And Capulet is giving his only living child that chance. He's giving her that power. If she wants you, then I'm happy to have you. But we got to make it so that she decides. Now, to soften that blow, and in fact, to give Paris the opportunity to chase a little bit, here's what he tells him. This night, I hold an old accustomed feast, whereto I have invited many a guest, such as I love, and you, among the store, one more most welcome makes my number more. So I'll tell you what, Paris, I'm throwing a party tonight. 
And I've invited a lot of my friends. And I like to think of you as my friend. And as my friend, I can say, if you come, the more the merrier. And my poor house will look to behold this night earth-treading stars that do make the dark heaven light. So, you come to this party I'm throwing tonight, there are going to be a lot of hot girls here. And that being the case, you might find some entertainment tonight, if you know what I'm saying. Such comfort as do lusty young men feel when well-appareled April on the heel of limping winter treads, even such delight among fresh female buds shall you this night inherit at my house. Hear all, see all, and like her most, whose merit most shall be. So at this party tonight, man, there are going to be so many beautiful girls that that same spring that we feel in our step when it first starts to warm up after a long winter and the buds start to bloom well these young flowers you'll have access to so come on paris come to the party tonight look at all the ladies and if you find one that you like you spend some time on that girl which on more view of many mine being one, may stand in number, though in reckoning none. Come, go with me. So all the hot girls are going to be here tonight. My daughter will be among them, but she's not really going to be the hottest girl there. So you come, you spend time with whoever you want. I think you'll have fun. Then he turns to his servant and hands him a piece of paper. Go, sir, trudge about through all fair Verona. Find those persons out whose names are written here, and to them say, my house and welcome on their pleasure stay. So he gives the servant a piece of paper saying, here's the invitation list. You go walk through the entire city. Everybody who's on that list, you tell them there's a party at my house tonight. And then Capulet and Paris walk off stage. And the, pe and the servant is left holding that paper. Find them out whose names are written here. And I like to imagine he turns the paper upside down. It is written that the shoemaker should meddle with his yard and the tailor with his last and the fisher with his pencil and the painter with his nets. But I am sent to find those persons whose names are here writ and can never find what names the writing person hath here writ. So the servant's problem is he's just been handed a really important job. He has to invite everybody who's on this list to the party and he can't read. That's a problem. Now he can't go to his boss and be like, hey boss, I, I'd like to do the job, but uh, I, I don't know how to read. Because if he does that, then he's probably going to get fired. He doesn't want to get fired. So his solution, I must to the learned in good time. So he's like, crap, I got to find somebody who knows how to read fast. And as he's thinking about that, in comes Benvolio and Romeo, clearly upper class, clearly educated. I'll show them the invitation to this list. What's the problem with that? Are these the people that the Capulets want coming to their party, given what we've seen in this scene so far? Hmm. So Benvolio and Romeo, ignorant of the servant watching them, continue their conversation about this girl who's got Romeo all twisted. Tut man, one fire burns out another's burning. One's pain is lessened by another's anguish. Turn giddy and be helped by backward turning. One desperate grief cures another's languish. Take thou some new infection to thine eye and the old rank poison, and the rank poison of the old will die. Now, <laughs> this is terrible advice, but it's advice that we're kind of familiar with in this day and age. You've even heard the phrase, fight fire with fire. Does that really make sense? If the office is on fire, does the fire department come in there and like start lighting other fires in order to put the fire out faster? Maybe not. It's not really the greatest strategy of all time. And Benvolio's solution here is like, okay, Romeo, you're hurting, 
So what you need to do is find someone else to hurt. She broke your heart. All right, go break somebody else's. Now, Romeo, who's probably getting a little sick of all of Tybalt's advice up to this point, says something that's kind of odd. Your plantain leaf is excellent for that. For what, I pray thee? For your broken shin. So Benvolio is saying, look, dude, you want to feel better. You got to hurt somebody. And Romeo's like, all right. You know, I've heard that plantain leaves. Have you guys ever seen plantains? You see them in the supermarket in the produce section sometimes. They're like these giant fibrous bananas. I've heard the leaves of the plantain are good for this. And Benvolio's like, what are you talking about, dude? And Romeo's like, for fixing your broken shin. And then he kicks Benvolio in the shin. And then Benvolio keeps hopping up and down. He's like, why, Romeo, are thou mad? And Romeo is like, not mad, but more bound than a madman is. Shut up in a prison, kept without food, whipped and tormented, and goddamn, good fellow. Because as this exchange has been taking place with the kicking in the shin and Romeo talking about how he's not crazy, but he feels like he's wrapped up in a straitjacket like a crazy person. He feels like he's imprisoned just like a prisoner. He's being denied food and tortured and, oh, uh, hey dude, what's up? And the servant says, God, Giga Den, I pray you, sir, can you read? And Romeo's response is, I, my own fortune and my misery. So, sir, and asks him, are you educated enough to know how to read? Romeo's like, yeah, and I'm sorry about that. And the servant says, well, perhaps you learned it without book, but I pray, can you read anything you see? And Romeo's like, I, if I know the letters and the language. So, like, Romeo is trying to joke with this guy. He's like, saying, yeah, I can read as long as it's in a language I understand. So if you give it to me and I'm a person who speaks English and it's in English, I can read it. You give it to me and it's in Arabic, I'm going to be confused, right? It's a perfectly reasonable thing for Romeo to say here. But the servant interprets what Romeo is saying as saying, like, I only know some words or I don't really know how to read. And so the servant says, you say honestly, rest you Mary. And he starts to walk away, at which point Romeo has to like grab me like, stay, fellow, I can read. And then he pulls out the invitation and he starts reading. Signor Martino and his wife and daughters, County Anselmaine and his beauteous sisters, the lady widow of Vitruvio, Signor Placentio and his lovely nieces, Mercutio and his brother Valentine, my uncle Capulet, his wife and daughters, my fair niece Rosaline, Livia, Signor Valentino and his cousin Tybalt, Lucio and the lively Helena. A fair assembly, whither should they come? So Romeo reads the invitation and he's like, wow, that's, uh, that's some pretty interesting names. Where are they all going? The servant, in his obtuse sort of way, says, Up! Whither? To supper. To our house. Whose house? My master's. Indeed, I should have asked you that before. And now I'll tell you without asking, my master is the great rich Capulet, and if you be not of the house of Montagues, I pray you, come up and crush a cup of wine. Rest you, Mary. And he leaves. So, Romeo and Benvolio just got the inside information about the Capulet party that's going to be going on that night. You can see where this is going. So Benvolio says, at this same ancient feast of Capulets sups that fair Rosaline whom thou so lovest. Now that's critical. What's the name of the girl that Romeo's been obsessing over? It ain't Juliet. Romeo hasn't met Juliet yet. He's in love with some girl named Rosaline. So at this party, Rosaline's going to be there with all the admired beauties of Verona. Go thither. And with unattainted eye, compare her face with some I shall show, and I'll make thee think thy swan a crow. 
So Benvolio, when he hears about this, is like, dude, this is perfect. At that party, Rosalind, who's got you all twisted up, is going to be there. And all of the other hot, eligible girls of the city. So go, and we'll put a scale up. And I'll let you see who's more beautiful, Rosaline or any of these other girls. And I think I know what the answer is going to be. You'll like the other girls. But Romeo's not listening to that. When the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fires. And these, who often drown could never die, transparent heretics be burned for liars. So if I ever say another girl is more beautiful than Rosaline, then you can do me the way we do people who betray the faith and you can burn me at the stake and my tears will turn into fire before that happens. All right. That will happen before I make myself a liar. One fairer than my love the all-seeing sun never saw her match since the world first begun. Tut, you saw her fair, none else being by, herself poised with herself in the other eye. But in that crystal scales, let there be weighed your lady's love against some other maid that I will show you shining at this feast, and she shall scant show well that now shows best. So, Romeo's like, Psh. I am not interested. There's no girl who is more beautiful than Rosaline. You are wasting your time. And Benvolio's like, dude, you only ever looked at Rosaline by herself. If you look at her and then compare her to some other hot girl, you're going to see she's not all that. Just come on out and I'll show you. Romeo says, I'll go along. No such sight to be shown, but to rejoice in the splendor of mine own. So it sounds like Romeo is going to go to the party, but not for the reason Benvolio wants him to go to the party. Benvolio wants him to go to the party to check out all the other hot girls. Romeo is just going to go be like a creepy stalker boy and like stand next to Rosaline and breathe. <sighs> creepy little dude. I'm sorry. I really don't like Romeo. But yeah, he's going to go to look at Rosaline. Benvolio is going to try to show him the other girls. We know who else is going to be at that party. You can see how this action is taking shape. All right, so we cut away from Romeo and Benvolio finding out about the Capulet party to back inside the Capulet household. But instead of seeing the men folk with their plots and machinations, now we get to see the, the side of the women and what they're up to. Now, the important thing as we go through this scene is going to be the power dynamic that exists among Lady Capulet, the nurse, and Juliet. Pay attention to how these characters talk, how they talk to each other. It's going to tell you about them. It's going to tell you about how they see each other. And it's going to tell you about the relationships that exist between them. And it's not, it's a little bit different from the way mothers and daughters interact in this day and age. So Lady Capulet begins, Nurse, where is my daughter? Call her forth to me. How cold and in command is Lady Capulet? Compare that to the nurse. Now, by my maidenhead, at twelve-year-old I bade her come. What lamb, what ladybird? God forbid, where is this girl? What, Juliet? So, pretty stark contrast between those characters. Lady Capulet's lines would be perfect coming out the mouth of, like, an evil queen in a Disney movie. The nurse, on the other hand, swears by her own virginity, so she's a little bit vulgar, and well, let's be honest, uh, the nurse is not a virgin at this point in her life. And you do get the additional information of she brings up this idea of Juliet as a 12-year-old again, although a lot of people tend to ignore that based on the rest of the scene, but we'll get to that. And then she's got, like, pet names, nicknames for Juliet. What lamb, what ladybird, where is that girl? Now, listen to how Juliet addresses each of them. Juliet comes on stage. How now? Who calls? Your mother. Madam, I am here. What is your will? Do you see how Juliet shifted gears there? When she first thinks it's the nurse who's hollering at her, she's like, what? Who's calling me? And then when it's her mom, she changes to, Madam, I am here. 
what is your will? She becomes immediately formal, whereas with the nurse, she is informal. So, Lady Capulet, this is the matter. Nurse, give us leave a while. We must talk in secret. Nurse, come back again. And this is a critical scene here. So Juliet's mom, for all her attempts at being cold and in command, is about to give Juliet the talk, at least the closest thing to the talk about the birds and the bees that that she can, because she and Juliet, as you can probably guess from their conversation so far, are not exactly close. There's a reason why there's a nurse in this household at all. We know Juliet's family is pretty rich. We also knew that during this time, infant mortality and child mortality was a problem. So parents didn't really invest themselves the way they do today in close personal relationships with their children. Because no matter how much you may have wanted to as a mother or a father, when you were looking at that child, you knew there was a very good chance that you were going to end up burying that person. So one of the things rich families could do in order to prevent themselves from having to form that close social bond is they could pay in order to avoid having to do that incredibly intimate act, that, that act that is so critical for imprinting and bonding between a mother and a child, breastfeeding. The nurse is what was called back in the day a wet nurse. She was originally hired to nurse with breast milk, Juliet. So she, the nurse, is the one who has the close personal connection with Juliet. Juliet's mom, she doesn't even know how to talk to her. And we'll see as this scene goes on. Actually, she doesn't really even know how old Juliet is. They are not close. And now Juliet's mom is coming in here to give her the talk. She doesn't know what to say. So at first she's like, nurse, leave us we need to talk in secret and then after this like awkward pause where she's trying to figure out what she's going to say to juliet is like nurse i just remembered i need you to come back here i have remembered me thou hear our counsel thou know my daughters of a pretty age and the nurse says faith i can tell her age unto an hour so nurse you know how old my daughter is Lady Capulet says she's not 14, so she's not yet 14 years old. But then the nurse says, I'll lay 14 of my teeth, and yet to my teeth, if it be spoken, I have but four. She's not 14. How long is it now to Lammas Tide? A fortnight, an odd days. Okay, okay. Now this is this is getting a little weird. Now one, the nurse has some jokes here that are pretty interesting. So she just says like, I would bet 14 of my teeth, but if I tell the truth of it, I actually only have four teeth. But I would bet 14 of my teeth she's not 14. How long is it now to Lammas Tide, which is a religious holiday, not an important one, but Lady Capulet knows a fortnight and odd days. Uh, but the date is important to the nurse because it's the date that she uses when it comes to calculating Juliet's age. So the mom here is saying Juliet's almost 14, but pay attention to the nurse's math. And there's a couple of things here. Like one, nurse, not the most well-educated person in the world. You got to decide whether or not you trust her math. Two, there's part of this story that goes into this age calculation that you need to think about that the nurse doesn't apparently now apologize for the size on the screen i'll try and fix it in post but if i can't this is what it is just try to follow along with it because one of the problems the nurse has especially if you were here when we were reading her in classes she just doesn't have a filter and she doesn't know when to shut up so we've already got this like awkward conversation about to be had between Juliet and the mom. The mom calls the nurse back to try to ease things and the nurse is just gonna make things so much more awkward as she goes about just trying to answer that simple question. How old is Juliet? Is she of a marrying age? Which is what the mother is really trying to get to in this conversation. But the nurse, ignorant of all that, just goes off. Even or odd, if all the days of the year, come Lammas Eve, that night shall she be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age. 
Well, Susan is with God. She was too good for me. But as I said, on Lammas Eve night, she shall be 14. So even though the nurse is here for comic relief, there is some sadness in her story. Susan and Juliet were of an age. Who is Susan? She is with God now. Now we see why the nurse had milk to spare when Lady Capulet came to hire her as Juliet's wet nurse. The nurse's own child, Susan, died. And that's what gave her the opportunity to come and work in the Capulet household. But she will be 14 in two weeks, according to the nurse. But once again, let's go into the story a little bit and check the math there. That shall she marry, I remember it well, to since the earthquake now eleven years, and she was weaned, I'll never forget it, of all the days of the year upon that day. For I had laid for I had then laid wormwood on my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove house wall. Now, okay, we talked about how the nurse is gonna make this awkward and uncomfortable this story is part of it she's calculating in her head how old juliet is it's been 11 years since the earthquake says the nurse therefore i know she's 14 because on the earthquake she was weaned so we stopped breastfeeding her 11 years ago so once again typically with babies you stop breastfeeding after the first year Huh, Juliet's still 12 by this math. But anyway, so yeah, then the nurse goes into this awkward story about how she stopped breastfeeding Juliet. So put yourself in Juliet's shoes. You're 12 to 14 years old. Your mom's trying to give you the sex talk, which is already awkward enough. And now you have this other person in here talking about when she stopped you from breastfeeding. That's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for you. But yeah, on all the days of that year, I put wormwood to my dug. I put a bitter tasting herb on my breast. And that way, when the baby went to latch on, it was like, Ugh! and it spat out the breast. And that's how I was able to get it to stop asking me to give it milk. My Lord and you were then in Mantua. Nay, I do bear a brain. But as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on my nipple, my of my dug and it felt and felt it bitter pretty fool oh to see it tetchy and fall out with the dug so she put this bitter tasting herb on her breast the baby went to latch on and it was like Pah! and like threw up it because the comfort and the closeness that it was anticipating the breast milk it was anticipating had been replaced by this bitter tasting yuckiness and the baby threw a temper tantrum Shake, quoth the dove houses, twas no need. I trow to bid me trudge, and since that time it is eleven years, for then she could stand alone, nay, by the root. She could have waddled and run all about, for even the day before she broke her brow. So, by the cross, by the root, I swear it was eleven years ago today, or in two weeks, that we, we, we weaned her as a child. She was already starting to walk. She was already starting to toddle around because earlier the day before she had like fallen down and cracked open her skull. And then my husband, God be with his soul, I was a merry man, took up the child. Yeah, quoth he, dost thou fall upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wilt. Wilt thou not, Jewel? And by holidame, the pretty wretch left crying and said, I, <laughs> to see how, how a jest shall come about. I warrant, and should I live a thousand years, I never should forget it. Wilt thou not, Jewel, quoth he, and pretty fool, it stinted and said, I. Now, what I just read there probably didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, but it's actually like the nurse now in remembering back to the day she weaned Juliet from breastfeeding, remembers that the day before Juliet as a toddler had like fallen down and cracked open her skull. 
And when that happened, the nurse's husband, who also is dead, picked up Juliet and said, oh, pretty fool, when you're older and have more sense, you'll fall backwards instead of forwards. And Juliet said yes. Now, what did the husband mean with that joke? It's actually a really dirty joke, and not one that you should really tell to a tiny little toddler, but the nurse thought it was hilarious, so much so that she tells it twice. What position would a girl be in if she fell backwards? What was the husband really talking about? Again, you'll learn about that in Human Growth and Development. But the nurse thinks it's hysterical. Juliet and her mom are just like, awkward. And Lady Capulet says, enough of this, I pray, hold thy peace. And the nurse, who cannot stop laughing, says, yes, madam, yet I cannot choose but laugh to think that it should leave crying and say, I. And yet, I warrant, it had upon its brow a bump as big as a young cockerel's stone, a perilous knock, and it cried bitterly, yea, quoth my husband, fallest upon thy face, Thou wilt fall backward when thou comest to age, wilt thou not, Julie? And it stinted and said, A. I. Dang it, I always mess that up. But yeah, so not only did Juliet fall on her face and get a big knock on her head, but now the nurse is describing the knot that she got on the size of her head as as big as a cockerel's stone. A cockerel is a rooster, sometimes referred to as a cock, and a cockerel's stones are the cockerel's or rooster's testicles, which is a weird analogy to make, but in the nurse's head, all this makes sense because she understands why the mom is here. When the mom says Juliet's of a pretty age, Juliet's old enough to be married, in the nurse's head, marriage equals sex, not unlike our boy Romeo. Therefore, all of these sexual things that the nurse is talking about make perfect sense. And when the husband said that dirty joke to the two-year-old, it stinted. She was still crying and said, I, and said, yes, I will have more, more sense when I'm older and fall backwards. Juliet, who's also had enough of this, says, and stint thou too, I pray thee, nurse, say I, peace. So Juliet now looking at the nurse, the nurse is laughing so hard she's crying. And Juliet's like, look, stop telling the story. This is not a story I want to talk about or think about right now, nurse. And the nurse says, peace, I have done. God mark thee to his grace. Thou wast the prettiest babe that e'er I nursed. And I might live to see thee married once. I have my wish. And there's the truth of the situation. Yeah, the nurse is vulgar and crass and not educated and she's missing all her teeth, but does she care about Juliet? You better believe she does. She loves Juliet. So all right, I'll stop laughing, but I am happy. You're a beautiful baby and you're a beautiful girl now, Juliet, and I think you're old enough to get married. And if I had one wish on this planet, that wish would be to see you happily married. So Lady Capulet grabs hold of this opening in the conversation and says, Mary, that Mary is the very theme I came to talk of. Tell me, daughter Juliet, how stands your disposition to be married? Now, once again, this, this shows you just how awkward Juliet's mom is. Think about yourselves. If you were 12 to 14 years old and your parents came into your room and was like, so have you thought about marriage? What would you say? <laughs> Juliet, who like all young people has at least considered the idea of sex and marriage and what that could possibly mean maybe in her fantasies, isn't gonna talk about that with her mom. So she simply replies, it is an honor that I dream not of. So is, is Juliet really excited about getting married? Apparently not. It's an honor that I dream not of. She is not thinking about marriage right now. And the nurse says, an honor. Were I not thine only nurse, I would have said thou had sucked wisdom from my teat. So the nurse, once again, can't help but be crude. 
So what a smart thing to say, Juliet. If I wasn't the only one who ever nursed you, I would think you had sucked wisdom from the breast, but you sucked it from mine and I'm not that smart. And Lady Capulet just kind of tries to push past that and says, well, think of marriage now. Younger than you here in Verona, ladies of esteem are already, are made already mothers. Now, have we heard that before? Younger women than her are happy mothers made. Who said that? Paris said that. Isn't it interesting that in this talk about marriage with Juliet, Lady Capulet is quoting Paris. What does that tell us? Maybe Paris hasn't just been talking to old man Capulet. Maybe he's been working it on Lady Capulet as well. And Lady Capulet's going to extend that logic. By my count, I was your mother much upon these years that thou now are thou er, that er, that you are now a maid. Thus in brief, the valiant Paris seeks you for his love. So Lady Capulet doubles down on Paris's argument, saying, Juliet, I was actually younger than you are right now when I was pregnant with you. So Come on, girl, it's time you started thinking about getting married. And to tell you a secret, Paris wants you. Now, you got to understand a little bit about why Lady Capulet would want to push so hard for Paris to marry her daughter. Like, it has nothing to do with him being young or good looking or any of those things. What's more important is Paris is rich. Paris is related to the prince. Paris is a way to elevate and advance their family socially in terms of power, in terms of money. And that's what Lady Capulet sees here. Now, sure, I'm sure Paris is a perfectly nice guy, but what really matters is, Juliet, Paris wants you, and he would make a very good husband for you and for this family. You need to start thinking about marriage now. And the nurse, who who can catch what old Lady Capulet is saying, she she jumps on the bus. A man, young lady, lady, such a man as all the world. Why, he's a man of wax. And, and that's an odd phrasing there, but it's supposed to be a compliment. Back in the day, if you were a sculptor and you worked with a hammer and chisel shaping stone, you didn't just like pick up your hammer and chisel and start going at it. Typically, what you would do is you would get like a wax figure often in the shape of the stone that you were going to be working with. And then you would carve out a model of wax based on that. And then you would use that to guide you in how you would go about shaping the stone. So when the nurse says he's a man of wax, she's essentially saying he's a model of a man. Lady Capulet continues to compliment him. Why Verona's summer hath not such a flower. Nay, he's a flower in faith, a very flower. So Lady Capulet keeps piling on. And is either one of them giving Juliet a chance to answer? Not really. And in this, I think you can say Juliet's silence speaks volumes. Is Juliet thinking about Paris? Not really. So listen to how Lady Capulet kind of changes the longer she talks. What say you? Can you love the gentleman? This night you shall behold him at our feast. Read over the volume of young Paris's face, and find delight writ there with beauty's pen. Examine every married liniment, and see how one another lends content. And what obscured in their fair volume lies, find written in the margin under of his eyes. This precious book of love, this unbound lover, to beautify him, only lacks a cover. So not only is Lady Capulet excited about the prospect of Paris pursuing Juliet, she is now telling Juliet how to look at Paris so she will fall in love with him. Look at his face and see how beautiful it is. Look at his body and see how all the lines and tendons of his body seem formed in perfection. 
He is a precious book of love, an unbound lover. And there's a pun there. Books are bound. And when a book is bound, that's when you put the external cover on it. All he needs is a cover. Juliet, you can be the cover. The fish lives in the sea, and tis much pride for fair without the fair within to hide. That book in many's eyes doth share the glory that in gold clasps locks the golden story. So actually what Juliet's mom is saying here is once again, terrible advice. What dating advice have you possibly heard or just general life advice have you maybe encountered that has to do with books and covers? Don't judge a book by its cover. Just because it has like a really beautiful cover doesn't mean it's a good book. Juliet's mom is arguing the opposite, saying Paris is beautiful. And that beauty on the outside is the perfect mirror for the beauty that he has on the inside. So we're in short telling her, Juliet, you have to love Paris. And if you don't, you are blind and you are a fool. And then she hits the real heart of her argument. So shall you share in all that he doth possess by having him making yourself no less. Juliet's mom is telling her it's okay to be a gold digger. It's okay to marry Paris because he won't make your fortune less. In fact, he'll make you even richer. By having him, you make yourself no less. And then the nurse hearing this, once again, her mind goes to a sexual place no less nay bigger women grow by men once again what do men and women do that makes women get bigger you'll learn about in human growth and development so lady capulet after going off on this big speech and the nurse makes that awkward sex joke and then silence from juliet so she shifts gears she goes from telling juliet how to fall in love with Paris, to speak briefly. Can you like of Paris's love? Can you like him? And listen to Juliet here. She does a little bit of verbal Kung Fu. Juliet is not dumb. And even though as a woman in this society, she lacks power, she is still able to use words in order to help people hear what they want, to hear the answers that they that they want to hear without her actually having to say or put herself into a corner. So her mom is trying to nail her down. Can you love Paris? Can you like Paris? And Juliet's response is, I'll look to like if looking liking move. I'll look to like if looking liking move. So I'll try to like him if when I look at him, looking at him makes me like him. So if he looks good, I'll like him. But if not, I'm not going to like him. That's what she means. But Juliet's mom hears what she wants to hear and is like, good enough. But Juliet then softens a blow and says, but no more deep will I endart mine eye than your consent gives it strength to fly. So I'll like him, but I'll only like him as much as you give me permission to like him, mother. And then the servant comes in. Madam, the guests are come. Supper is served up. You are called. My young lady asked for the nurse cursed in the pantry and everything in extremity. I must hence to wait. I beseech you, follow straight. So the servant busts in. Guys, what are you doing up here? The party is getting started. Nurse, we need you helping out in the kitchen. Lady Capulet, you're the lady of the house. You're supposed to be greeting our guests. Juliet, uh, somebody's asking for you. I'll let you all guess who that is. And Lady Capulet's like, all right, all right, all right. We follow thee. The servant leaves. And Juliet's mom, before she, she walks out, says, Juliet, the county stays. Now, when they talk about county, they're not talking about, like, Sarpy County. They're talking about the Count Paris. So he is also royalty. He's waiting for you, Juliet. And the nurse gives Juliet a little bit of encouragement, saying, Go, girl, seek happy nights to happy days. So Juliet, go, try to fall in love, maybe get married, and then maybe have yourself some fun at night. <laughs>